hello, this is Judy Sleed again with the new hairdo. Uh, Beatrice just cut my hair. This is the place, the thing. And today I have a lovely playmate, <laughs> Rabbi Joshua Franklin. Thank you for coming. It's really my pleasure. It's uh, been a long time since I was trying to get you, to hook you. <laughs> ah. Well, I'm finally here. You finally got me hooked. <laughs> yes. So you are practicing at the East Hampton Jewish Center. At the Jewish Center of the Hamptons, yes. And I've been there for um, almost two years now. Two years? Almost, since almost. May 2017. Seems like yesterday. <laughs> it does, yeah. It's, uh, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind, but uh, I am here. Yes. Well, uh, quite a difference between uh, Rabbi uh, Zimmerman, who I also had on my show. He was a, a great friend of mine. And uh, you are a nice-looking young man. You could be a movie star. Oh, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> But you chose not to go on the stage. You chose the pulpit instead. That's right. Uh, and I've got, of course, big shoes to, to fill with, uh, with replacing Rabbi Zimmerman. He's yeah. really uh, an incredible rabbi and a giant among rabbis. And yes. so here I am, much yeah. younger, much less wise, <laughs> um, but nonetheless ready to serve the, the Jewish community in East Hampton. Yes. So uh, what made you choose this profession? Um, I start out by saying quite often people ask me to tell this story and uh, I must have told it a thousand times already, but uh, my father is a rabbi Oh. and um, I sometimes say I'm a rabbi even though my father is a rabbi. Oh. And by that I mean sometimes it's difficult growing up to be as the son of a rabbi. And um, you know my father's community was really his community, but and I was always known as my father's son, but it was hard for me to really develop my own personality and my own Jewish identity uh, being seen in my father's shadow. So, um, you know, I, I had a strong Jewish identity growing up. We had Shabbat dinners in our home every week. Of course, went to uh, religious school. Um, and I also even went to Jewish summer camp, which did allow me to find a, home, a Jewish home away from home and really develop my Jewish identity. But I'll say that uh, the time when I really start to begin to consider to become a rabbi, that was when I got to college. And it was there that, on a whim, I decided to take a Jewish studies class. I thought, um, intro to Hebrew Bible, this should be easy enough. I've learned Bible my whole life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll take this class and it'll be an easy A my first semester of college. Took the class and uh, it was not an easy A. It was an earned A. Um, and I had to work for it and I learned a tremendous amount. And uh, I really got a new perspective on the Bible, on Jewish life, on what it meant to be Jewish. And so I took another Jewish studies class and then another one. And then I began to study Hebrew and I studied abroad in Israel and I began teaching in a religious school. Um, and all of a sudden I found myself really loving this Jewish life, not just in the sense of being Jewish, but also in the sense of really wanting to teach Judaism and lead a Jewish community. And uh, so the thought of becoming a rabbi at that point in my life began to grow in my head to the point of uh, after grad school, I decided that the life of a rabbi was really for me. Great. And where did this all take place? My, my college, I went to Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Where were you? Oh, where did where, I grow up? Yeah, where did you grow up? So I grew up in Yonkers, New York, uh -huh. and uh, my father a rabbi in Riverdale, New York at Riverdale Temple. Wow. Yeah. My, I had a friend who used to go to Riverdale Synagogue. She lived there. And when I went to visit her, I went to that temple many times. Yeah. So you've been her. there before. Yeah. Is that something? And you might not know it, but I might have been sitting in the pews. Yes. And you just might not have known that so, uh, I was there. So are you familiar with Riverdale? Uh, I am. Uh, the place where I grew up in Yonkers is really right on the border of Yonkers and Riverdale. Oh, so you know, Riverdale Avenue, there was a bakery, the Heisler Bakery, that was my friend's bakery. On Riverdale Avenue, is that that's yeah. the one that used to be right by the Food Emporium? I don't know, but her bakery was on the corner, Heisler Bakery. Oh, maybe I'm thinking very, of a different one then. Very well known. That was many years ago, though since uh, she and her husband 
ran that, and it was, oh, I used to love to buy the bread there. They had made the best Jewish fry. <laughs> And they had uh, the Hungarian poppy seed roll. I love that. They don't make that as well as she did. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. If, you know, when I talk to people, we always find something in common that you never know. Well, there it is. It's a small world. Absolutely. So you, you grew up in Yonkers. That's right. And... Uh, so you know, but and you have any siblings? I do. I have two older brothers, and what both of whom are not rabbis. They're not. No, they are not. We're all actually very different from one another, and I guess I was the only one who went down uh, the road of a Jewish profession. And what? Where are they now? Uh, they both live in uh, the New York area. My oldest brother in New York City, and my middle brother in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, your mom, what did she do? My mom uh, is still a professional uh, Jewish genealogist. So oh, she's what? a Jewish genealogist. She studies people's family trees. Oh, she, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, so she researches and helps people uh, understand the stories uh, about where they came from who their families are, and even connecting people with long-lost relatives. Oh, I must look her up. You should. <laughs> That's where does she live? In Yonkers? They still live in Yonkers, yes. Wow. I've never been to Yonkers. I went to Riverdale, as I yeah. said, and many other places in the Bronx. Yonkers isn't <laughs> worth it. Isn't <laughs> worth the trip. Don't worry no. about it. Riverdale is enough. Okay, now the next big question. How did you end up in the Hamptons? <laughs> yeah, so before uh, coming to the Hamptons as a rabbi for four years in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And in Wellesley at Temple Beth Elohim, I was one of four rabbis in what you might call a, a mega congregation. It was a 1,200 family congregation, um, huge staff. Uh, it was very organizational. And again, being one of four rabbis and not the senior rabbi, an associate rabbi there, um, I really... Um, after about four years, I, I realized that my growth potential had reached its peak and that uh, if I wanted to do new things as a rabbi and expand my horizon, that the next step for me would really to be a, a senior rabbi at my own congregation. And so I looked uh, really all around the country to find the right community for me. And uh, I wound up here at the Jewish Center of the Hamptons. And I think the reason why here and not anywhere else is that this is an incredibly unique community, both in terms of the community itself and also the Jewish community is quite unique as well. Um, whereas most communities operate from uh, September to June and then they kind of shut down or go into hibernation mode, our synagogue is really the opposite. Summer is our busy months mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're really incredibly busy from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And then after that, we still have a very active full-time community, but uh, it's a little more relaxed during the off-season, like right now in February, when uh, things in the Hamptons are just a little more, well, empty. Do you find that uh, it's like the congregation, b outside from the summer, that it's, it's uh, small? Not really. I mean, we have a, a good group uh, who attends Friday and Saturday morning. Uh, we still have classes both in the city that I teach and also out here in the Hamptons on Fridays. Um, there's still a lot going on, and we're not, uh, we're not dead. We're actually pretty lively all throughout the year. Just uh, the Hamptons over the summer becomes triples in size, and so does our congregation as well. I was always wondering about uh, New York. You said you go to New York. How come uh, you s the same congregation has a, a that you give service in Manhattan? I teach a class in Manhattan. Uh, we recognize that a lot of our community are weekenders, or a lot of our community um, comes out just over the summer. Um, mm -hmm. And, well, also a lot goes down to Florida for the winter and splits their yeah. time between Florida, the Hamptons, and New York City. So we try to go and meet people where they are. And quite literally, that's in New York City during most of the week. 
so I teach a class in New York City during the week. I meet with wedding couples. I make hospital visits during the week in New York City. Oh. I'm doing a young professionals learning circle in the city. Sometimes we have events in the evening. Uh, there's really a lot going on. So I spend one day a week in the city, generally Tuesdays. And when I'm there, I have a really full day of uh, meeting people, teaching, and uh, I was going to say, it's a lot. It keeps you very busy. It does, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember they started doing this uh, thing just a few years ago, going, starting to go give classes or functioning in, in New York City. Yeah, yeah, I actually say that, you know, we're not less busy necessarily in the off season, we're different busy. Yeah. Which means that over the summer, I'm not going into Manhattan because it would take me five hours to get each way. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I, but I yeah. do go into the city from uh -huh. uh, October through May. And uh, I know that you, you have a beautiful child and you have a beautiful wife. That's right. So, where did you happen to meet? Uh, my wife and I met when uh, I was in my first year of rabbinical school, uh, studying in Jerusalem, and she was on a birthright trip. Um, so one night, one of my good friends, also a colleague of mine, now, now a rabbi down in Philadelphia, he asked me if I wanted to go to dinner with double one of his friends. Date. They were going to meet up. <laughs> no, not even a double date. It was just his, just his friend. He grew up with my wife, and uh, they were going to meet up and go out to dinner and wanted to see if I wanted to join. And so I did. I, I joined. We, we all went out to dinner. And uh, during the course of the dinner, we became uh, friendly and um, got to know each other better. And so, I mean, a, a birthright trip is a 10-day trip to Israel. And it's really a whirlwind of a trip. She didn't really have any time to spend with me because she was traveling the country during the course of 10 days. They barely have, uh, you know, an hour of free time. And this was really some of their only free time during the trip. So it wasn't really until about six, seven months later when uh, I returned home to the States that, uh, that we connected and I called her up and we went out on a date and the rest is history. <laughs> and now we have uh, a three and a half year old daughter, Lila, and uh, with one on the way, expected. Uh, next month, next right? Next month, anytime. Yeah. Well, really anytime now, but uh, <laughs> early, early March. Yeah, well, mazel tov. Thank you. It's going to be a girl? It's going to be another girl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you picked out a name already? Uh, I think we're between a couple names still. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, we debate back and forth what the name should be. And, you know, yeah. I have my names that I like, and she has Horace. her names. And uh, then yeah. when we think we've agreed on something, the next day she'll say, oh, you know, I really don't know if I like that <laughs> name. And I, I think it's going to be a kind of wait and see what she looks like kind of thing. <laughs> And when we're in the hospital and the baby's born, we'll take a look at her and we'll say, does this name fit? Does this name fit? And uh, God willing, we'll, we'll have the right name. My first child, which is Jody, she was born, she didn't have a name because we couldn't decide. <laughs> I wanted to name her Pamela. And then my husband, oh, we don't want, and he was a, uh, a newspaper man. He worked for the Long Island Press, so he made his colleagues print up a newspaper with a baby crying. My mommy wants to name me Pamela, and I don't. <laughs> That's funny. So he decided. He said we should name her half of his name and half of mine. And I named Jody. His name was Joel, and mine Judy. So that's how she became Jody. Oh, that works. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to go down that route. Uh, my wife's name is Stephanie, so <laughs> I, I, I don't really see the combination of names working out too well. But we'll, we'll get to something, Steph I'm sure. Joe. Joe Steph. Joe Steph. We're, we're, we're not going to, yeah, I don't think that's happening, unfortunately. Yeah, but you gave me an opportunity to remember that. That was a funny time that, you know, when she was born, she had no name. <laughs> they gave her the name afterwards. So uh, what do you do besides, do you have any hobbies? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of hobbies, sometimes too many hobbies. Um, I golf. Oh, I yes, like I know you are musical. I I'm, mean, I read I'm musical. Love I like to play guitar and ukulele. Um, I uh, like photography. I even started doing darkroom photography again, which I really enjoy. 
Um, you know, I, I say I like to do those things. I also like biking and cycling and snowboarding. And uh, Wow. So I've got a lot of things that I like to do, but uh, I've noticed that since we had our first child, I've been doing those things significantly less. <laughs> and I would imagine that when we have our second child, it'll be it's even be harder to find the time to, uh, to enjoy those hobbies. But nonetheless, I still call them hobbies. And, uh, oh, yeah, you're going to have plenty of time to enjoy that. Do you, did you study music? I didn't. Uh, I just actually happened to hang around with a lot of musical people. And you picked um, it up by yourself? Um, yeah, I, I picked up playing guitar. I don't pretend to be a musician. I really just enjoy playing music. And I know that there are plenty of incredibly talented people around me who are musicians, like our <laughs> cantor at the Jewish Center, Deborah Stein, who's really a phenomenal singer. I don't and pretend to uh, be a musician. I, she's the musician. Yeah. I'm the person who likes to play music. And. Uh, What's her name, the uh, executive director? What I had her on my show also. Diane Weiner. Diane, she also likes to sing and She and does have a phenomenal around. voice. <laughs> yes. So you did some things, skits together. I read about it someplace. It's for certain holidays, oh, you did so some we, skits. We had, we had done a, a video. That, uh, just to promote the high holidays and something fun for our community. And uh, I think it was two years ago, and actually Diane was singing in that video. Yeah. It's, uh, it was to a parody to a popular song a few summers ago called Despacito. Uh -huh. And we called the video uh, Tequila Gadolacito, <laughs> which is, I guess, a Jewish pun if, uh, if you don't know. Tequila Gadola is the big note that you'd play on the shofar, the ram's horn, yeah. on the high holidays. And so it was uh, a real fun video. It went viral, actually. The video got like 30,000 <laughs> views on YouTube. Oh. And uh, our community really loved it. And we got a number of views on Facebook as well, on Instagram and social media. Um, it was a really fun project. <laughs> yeah, and who did the video? Um, we had a, a woman in our community, a really phenomenal videographer and producer. Her name is Kate Gilroy, who produced oh, it. Oh, Kate Gilroy, yeah. I was thinking of Michael's uh, girlfriend or wife. You know who I'm thinking. Oh, Michael Semt. Yeah. Oh, so you're thinking of Rivlin's wife. Yes. Okay. Because she does photography. She does, and she's an excellent photographer. Yes. <laughs> so I thought maybe she did the. No. Uh, well. Oh. <coughs> she, she is talented, though. Right. So. Uh, which is the most busy holiday, would you say? Uh, the I mean, New we're Year's? definitely most busy for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the High Holy Days. Um, yeah. At the Jewish Center, we our sanctuary isn't big enough, so we, uh, we put up erect tent. a tent yes. on our lawn that holds about a thousand people. And actually, last Rosh Hashanah, we filled the tent, and so we're yeah, definitely the there. we're definitely the busiest on Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. um, we're also quite busy over the summer in a different kind of way. And we're busy even on Passover, um, where we remove all of the benches from our sanctuary. It's a really amazing sanctuary, a Norman Jaffe sanctuary, uh, the only sacred space that he ever designed. And we, uh, we put tables in our sanctuary and have an amazing Passover Seder with about uh, 80 to 100 people. Yeah, so. I attended several of those functions. And very nice it was. <laughs> yeah, Passover <laughs> is, is one of the most celebrated, probably the celebrated Jewish holiday outside of Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. And uh, what do you like? You like latkes? Well, latkes <laughs> are more of a Hanukkah thing. I do, I do happen to uh, like latkes. Oh, it's more of a Hanukkah. See, what yeah. do I know? But they have it on Passover, don't they? Um, well, no. No. Because most latke recipes call for flour. And on um, Passover, you, you don't use well, flour. I know in, that you uh, don't, but you your, have uh, latkes because flour is forbidden. You're not supposed to eat any leavened bread or any products that contain any leaven, flour being one of them. So, how come I remember that latkes for Passover? Bec I well, suppose well, what you is it? I suppose you could make potato pancakes without oh, potato, flour. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Potato or maybe you're thinking of potato kugel. Yeah. Which potato is popular on, uh, yeah. on Passover. Yeah, I like all those things. Okay. 
And I used to make them when I was younger. Now I'm getting a little, uh, I'm sorry, I'm playing with the microphone. <laughs> I'm getting lazier as I get oh. older. <laughs> And uh, I remember we used to dance a lot. You still dance a lot during service, in the middle of the service? Yeah, uh, so on a Saturday morning, if you join us for Shabbat, yeah. um, one of the things that we do when we bring the Torah out into our community is yes. uh, we do what's called a hakafa, which we walk the Torah around our community so people can uh, yes. give it honor by, by touching it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then towards the very end of the hakafa, people come and dance around the bima, around, uh, right. around the lectern. Yeah, I was one of the dancers, <laughs> always. Yeah, you're never too old uh, to come back and dance with us. Yeah. Well, the last few, uh, I was just telling this friend of mine that the last few months I, I was bombarded with a lot of bodily aches. I don't know where it came from, but uh, it's gone. It's going away, so I'm feeling a lot better. Thank God. That sounds yeah. like good news. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was going to be the end of me. <laughs> but uh, God wants me to be around because uh, I feel very youthful. Good. <laughs> now, age is all about how you feel, I think, and not about yeah. how old or how many years you actually have under your belt. Yes, and thank God I'm pretty healthy uh, considering how old I am and uh, compared to some other people who are much younger are afflicted with a lot of illnesses. Yeah. So uh, um, have you written anything? I'm afraid to ask. Uh, I have not published a book. <laughs> um, some articles here and there, but uh, I have not started working on a book, though maybe I do have an aspiration to do that someday. And you make notes? Yeah, I know. I give a sermon every, every Saturday morning. So, so you I'm have always, to write. I'm, I'm always forced to be creative each and every week and to talk about something new. And yeah. uh, I try to offer something novel each week, which is to say I don't want to preach the same message each and every week. I really want to actually give us a new way to think about uh, the world in which we live through a Jewish lens. That's wonderful. And also to take our ancient traditions and make them new and make them fresh and holy. That's um, wonderful. So, you know, I've got a lot of material, but uh, I have not yet come up with a book of my own. Well, you could save all those sermons and make a book out of it. I certainly can do that. You know, the problem, though, is that uh, I normally just write out a couple notes and I really like to be on my feet and like to speak from, uh, from my heart. And, uh, oh, really? And when, mm -hmm. I, when I have something in front of me, I think, I don't know, I, I write a different way than I, than I orate. Don't you have a newsletter? We do. We have a monthly bulletin, and I write something for the bulletin. Yeah. And occasionally I'll adapt something I've said on, on a Saturday to, mm -hmm. the, to the bulletin. That actually takes me time, though, because I have to go of through. Course. I have to go through my notes, and I have to to readjust and I have to actually write like I'm a writer and not write like I'm um, talking. And that's sometimes uh, just a different art. So actually your job is very creative. Uh, I would say yeah, I, I, have to be, I have to be creative in my, in my position. Writing and acting. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm acting, but uh, <laughs> of course <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe performing is also the wrong word. But I, I guess there's the expectation that uh, I have to be a little bit dynamic. That I oh, have to yeah, and you are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you are. <laughs> so it's very rewarding from what I hear from you, and you're doing a good job. Yeah, I, re I really do love what I do. Um, um, yeah, I, I say sometimes, I didn't get in it for the chicks and the money. Even though I your got daughter wants I love you Judaism. to be a plumber. Yes, my, my daughter <laughs> said recently, her good friend is a plumber in town. And so my daughter says, Dad, Dad, why don't you become a plumber? And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I yeah, went, went through a lot of, lot of education, will, a lot of schooling to become a rabbi. You will never and, live uh, that down. No. Oh, she will never live that down. Well, she also tells me that she wants to be a rabbi. At least, oh. you know, she's three and a half. She'll probably change her mind. But... Uh, yeah. 
you know, who knows? Maybe she'll be a rabbi and maybe she'll appreciate one day exactly what it is that I do. So I want to thank you again for coming. It's been very nice learning all these things about you. Well, thank you for having me, Judy. And I want to thank Daniel for doing all this work and uh, Andy Sabin for sponsoring me. And uh, you can watch me on YouTube. I've been doing, I have more than 200 of my shows uploaded, so I hope you're going to keep watching. And uh, what would happen if any of this would become viral? <laughs> God willing, <laughs> it does. I hope I was that interesting. So uh, you have to practice your signature. If people are going to come and ask you for your autograph. Oh, God, <laughs> willing, I'm, God willing, I become that famous <laughs> from this show. <laughs> Yeah, from this show, you'd be surprised. But you, people probably recognize you just from the synagogue. Yeah, I, I think yeah. Uh, it's a small town, and I walk yeah. down the street and recognize people, and they recognize me too. I get that sometimes. People say, I've seen you someplace before. Yeah, I've seen you on TV. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on TV. Now me too. <laughs> yes. So, okay. Okay. Um, it's been a half hour. It just goes so quickly. And don't forget, I had my hair done by, <laughs> what did I say? Beatrice. Beatrice did my hair. Okay. Yeah. And I kept my earrings on all this time. How do you like that? Pleasure, Judy. <laughs>